things. A lot still find that hard to believe. Some think it's a lab-made product, but oh no, they're very real and very natural. You're not tripping either. The blue insularis, native to the Lesser Sunda Islands, are one of three color forms. Yellow, green, and blue. And they're definitely getting more and more popular over the years. Is it all because they're an odd bright sky blue color? Yes! And it is, in fact, very odd. As many snakes would prefer to blend into their surroundings, the blue insularis, like the coral snakes and crates, choose to stand out as a way of telling predators that they are this bright for a reason, a toxic treat that's not worth the taste. So without further ado, let's dive right into the story. It all starts with me realizing she's getting ready to give birth, but it was right before a jungle trip down south. So I had to move her into a temporary tub so babies become easier to separate and overall be in a safer spot to reach than if they were in their regular enclosure. To my surprise, she had just been in the birthing process about an hour or so before I got back, so I got to witness a couple more babies being born and observe them find a way out of that yolk sac. Since I didn't want to interfere with her and the fragile young, I kept my distance. It was an absolute joy to watch, and I'm bummed the best I got were blurry plastic glimpses for you guys, but it was a beautiful moment, and you'll, you'll just have to use your imagination. The babies were born much bigger in size, and calmer in demeanor, when compared to the last batch. Fifteen of the babies are blue, while only three are green. The mother is acting slightly defensive, understandably, she's cornered with her babies, while there's an overgrown monkey holding a metal square, standing a few feet away, giggling and smiling like a maniac. So it kind of justifies her uneasiness. And at this point in their lives, they are already capable of delivering a venomous bite. And unlike the helpless human infant, these fragile gummy snakes are ready for the world's harsh conditions. They're so freaking cute, it melts my damn heart. I can't help but boot one on its goddamn cute stinking face. What happens after this? I separated the mom back into her old enclosure and waited until the baby's first sheds, till I separated them as well. Now comes the fun part, moving them one by one into their new homes. This can definitely be a long process requiring a lot of patience with these fragile babies. Let's discuss the reasoning behind their new setups. I get away with using these small boxes because baby vipers are ambush hunting predators. They sit and wait for a meal and then sleep, finding water occasionally, and everything else is basically trying not to get eaten by literally everything bigger than them. The venom of these snakes target living tissue and blood cells. Hemotoxic snake bites often leave permanent damage, and one has to remember that just because they pack that potent cocktail doesn't mean they want to dump it all on us. It is primarily used to take down and aid in digesting prey. In fact, they probably only want to use it for that. Us stumbling across one accidentally and taking a bite doesn't mean they're out to get us, it means we startled them. It's like you're walking alone in the dark and someone taps you on the shoulder and you turn around and give them a left wing. It's an accident, you don't mean to, you don't expect that kind of shit to happen. Heck, most venomous snake bites occur due to some local messing with venomous snakes when they shouldn't be. It also doesn't make the handling I do safe either, for one mistake could have severe consequences. I just choose to believe in the snakes a bit, I'm showing no ill intent, and I'm only here to aid. Each snake's reaction is going to be different. Wild animals will never do what I tell them to do. So expect the unexpected. By no means should you try and work with venomous snakes without a mentor. I'm Chris Wheat, and I approve this message.
Once all the babies have been housed and settled in, I checked back with mom back in her old enclosure and she started refusing frozen thawed meals. So I had to switch to live. I need her to gain back all that weight she lost and regain her strength. It was a bit messy, but after two meals, I missed it their enclosure and made sure she was hydrated. All that's left is feeding the babies. What you see me doing here is teasing the snake a bit, trying to get a strike response. Cause when you're dealing with baby crims or a lot of arboreal vipers, there's two outcomes. One, the baby actually strikes and holds on to the meal, or the snake darts out and makes this whole process much more painful. I always try to get babies from this genus onto frozen thawed pinkies, as it gets them established quickly, less worry and stress whenever feeding day rolls around. Though usually the first attempt takes a couple hours, the moment the step is complete is when I can finally lean back in my chair and let out a sigh. The toughest part is finally over. I do not involve force feeding even if it makes the process much shorter. Cause once they know how to take these on their own, I don't have to be worried. And this is completely different from assist feeding by the way, as quote unquote force feeding involves shoving the prey down the animal's mouth either halfway or full and expecting the animal to hold it down without regurgitating. A method being more disused over the years and for good reason. It's a boatload of stress and risky to the handler and the snake. You could get envenomated, you could tear the snake's esophagus, the list goes on. Assist feeding on the other hand is done more with a long tube inserted down the animal's throat. It's less stressful, less risky, with a more gentle approach, usually done to help the weak or ill-treated specimens come back to health. To be a responsible keeper, you have to be able to do what is necessary. Some juveniles will be extremely picky compared to others. Perhaps the answer lies deep in their adaptive lifestyle as normally in the wild babies will take on amphibians or lizards, finding mice when they're growing into sub-adults. So a juvenile stumbling across a random pinky in the wild probably doesn't happen. I could end up spending 40 minutes or more just on one baby, so it definitely can be exhausting. I can't just go about blabbing that I'm living the dream or something, it's actual hard work. But thankfully, it's work that I love doing. More so, I love showing it to you guys. Anyway, the breeding process can be very fun and very rewarding, but nothing comes free of work, and mind you, it includes a lot of patience. I know I've said it before, but this phrase honestly needs repeating. But there is a grand payoff, and it's raising the younglings up and watching them grow to be like their spectacular parents. Either it be in my care or updates from people I trust. It's a big reward all in itself. This was 10 minutes of fun, cut from hours and hours of chasing babies across my table. So I hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you guys for watching and uh, see you in the next one.